fact, I should uh, admit that I'm a, a structural person dealing with uh, wave propagation and NDT, and I'm not a material scientist. And I'm, I feel nervous to stand in front of people like Raja here. I'm not sure what whether I'll be able to do a good job on this. Uh, so this uh, just got into this corrosion uh, accidentally when uh, about uh, 10 years back, uh, uh, our Boeing person, Dr. Shankaran, said that uh, they have a problem on pitting. And uh, they've done uh, extensive tests and things like that. And they didn't have uh, a quantitative model to model these predictions, essentially. And we have been talking about corrosion prediction all along in the, from yesterday now, most of the people. And this is one step towards that. And subsequently, I got introduced to uh, Professor Akid yesterday. You heard him. Uh, we had a UK proposal, and where uh, uh, he was excited about what we did uh, with the Boeing. And he said that uh, they have the corrosion protection center, which John talked about some time back. And uh, he was part of it. And they had extensive uh, uh, corrosion testing uh, equipments we didn't have here. And uh, we collaborated to have both uh, the modeling and also testing to take it to the logical conclusion. So that's where I begin here. And uh, many of this uh, I learned in the process because I'm not a trained material scientist. OK, so uh, yesterday you saw a lot of this presentation which Bob made on corrosion fatigue. It is all basically the data which was generated by my student, Ramesh, who just graduated last week, about 15 days back. And uh, this topic is so hard that the moment he graduated, he got three postdoc offers, and he has joined uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, and I had a number of collaborators, uh, including I also had a small project with uh, Pratt & Whitney. I thank uh, Deepa, the Olu from University of Manchester, uh, uh, Rafael. And uh, these are some of the funding agencies which enabled this to happen. OK, so basically, I'm going to introduce, and I'm going to talk much more than what Bob talked yesterday. Uh, that was only one part of the modeling. We have done a lot more modeling beyond that, because any models uh, based on certain assumptions and hypotheses, we need multiple models to verify each other. So we have made more models to understand the pitting corrosion. And uh, we have d done uh, different samples to bring the interplay between the chemistry and the mechanics that is associated with uh, pitting corrosion. So you know there are different, if you say, nine different forms of corrosion. Some of them are uniform corrosion, galvanic corrosion, pitting, stress corrosion, cracking, just the previous speaker said, bacterial corrosion, crevice corrosion, etc. Among them, the most uh, devastating form of corrosion is pitting because it's very hard to detect and extremely difficult to model. And one of the fundamental things is what are the models, what are the physics laws that governs the pitting is the fundamental thing. And I find that uh, there is very little information on the physics-based models. Most of the models are developed or empirical based on testing. So when we have the physics-based models, then when we go to the larger prediction of uh, basically uh, trying to get the corrosion database, it's very essential to have this. So if you look at here, uh, the pit, how does this form? Most of the materials are coated. They have a surface film, coating film. But uh, this film keeps on breaking. And the breakage happens after some time, and the pit will start growing. And the most important part of the pit is, after pit grows to a certain level, it saturates. And then the pit will translate into crack. And the cracking will happen uh, under the action of fatigue. So this is a very important part. 
that is required uh, to be understood uh, before the cracking takes place. So there are various assumptions, and still we don't know why the pit surface film breaks, what causes it, maybe surface stresses that place, because the coating which you give can create surface stresses that can create uh, breaks repeatedly. And uh, that's why you keep on, uh, yesterday uh, our NTPC person said they spend 40 crores on painting. They keep painting, it breaks, then pit forms. This is a continuous process. So there are various people uh, assumptions. One of the things is the condos model, where pits and cracks are comparable at transition. These are basically happens. LEFM, that is linear elastic fracture mechanics happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is applicable, and cracks are always uh, intricate at the base of the pit. These are some of the hypotheses which we make. Yesterday you saw this flight. So basically, to find the pit to crack transition, what is this criteria? And yesterday, uh, Bob said that uh, they found that at 0.23 percent strain, as the pit grows at the mouth of the pit, the crack will initiate. And this has been experimentally verified through a number of uh, examples. And this slide we saw yesterday's in Bob's presentation. And we use this as a parameter. Like we have K1C, we will use this as a threshold at which point the pit to crack transition can happen. And this is the fundamental assumption we use in all of our modeling studies. So here, what we have done is uh, basically, uh, we have done a number of different models. Yesterday, Bob talked about the probabilistic cellular automata and uh, FEM model, we extended it to extended FEM because uh, you have two surfaces here. One is the electrolyte site and the metal site. There is an interface, and this interface keeps on changing when the pitting happens. So we need to track this. <coughs> so you need, if you use a conventional FEM type, there is going to be a mesh has to be refined every time the pit happens. So instead of doing that, we used extended FEM with enrichment function so that this enrichment can be modeled, and only once we need to model it. So essentially, what we have done is, uh, we have done a number of different models. What uh, he talked about is only the uh, PCA model, I'm sorry, uh, the SRA, and we extended it to what is called peridynamic model, which is an integral model. And we have used, uh, shown how we can use that uh, integral model. Uh, one of the two important phenomena in pitting corrosion is uh, the corrosion process, oxidation process, and the diffusion process. And both are governed by one is called the Faraday's law and the Fick's law. And we have modeled that chemically using extended FEM. And mechanically, you know, we can model the, the conventional FEM. We couple these things together. That's the whole philosophy that we use. And uh, we used uh, uh, basically uh, the PDML model, uh, which is uh, different from the PCA model. And we coupled PCA, PDML, everything. The ML stands for machine learning. Why? Because the peridynamic model takes enormous amount of time. One, one run takes about two to three days. So we need to reduce the number of times that we do. So we couple with the machine learning approach, with the conventional FE approach, we couple them together to predict the pitting process. So es essentially, I am not going to talk much about pitting. One of the things that <coughs> need for pitting is to find out what are the chemical species that form it. So what we call the pubic diagram is the very important. This is well known for steel, but it is not well known for many other metals. There is an established procedure that we can get. For example, if you try to do the same for the nickel-based superalloy, especially for hot corrosion, uh, this is very uncertain. But for steel, there are uh, 30, 22 species, and four of them are very important. We model this in the cellular automata. That's what you saw yesterday. I'm not going to do go into details of that because you heard about it yesterday and here. So essentially there are corrosion rules. For each rules we set up a probability. These rules are essentially what happens when 
the hydrogen is near water. Uh, so there are certain rules, and we say that this transforms into uh, a new product with some probability of corrosion. So this is the corrosion rules that happens, and this, uh, the second one is the diffusion rules. So this is the diffusion rules. I'm not going to yesterday, it was all talked about. So based on this, we find the, you have the top layer of the electrolyte site will be modeled by this. And uh, once we have this, so this is again yesterday we saw we have a Gutmann relationship which couples the, mecha, the, the chemical model, that is the PCO model with the XFEM model. So this is a result which Bob did not show, I am showing it. This is under uh, different uh, stress levels, what happens. You see that when the stress levels, what you apply to the metal side is uh, uh, 200 MPa, the threshold strain will not happen. That is, pit to crack transition is not an issue. But as the stress increase, you see at the different times, as the stress increase, the time at which the, stress, uh, the pit to crack ha transition happens is much higher. So we can easily predict this using this model. Uh, this is uh, a comparison with experiments which Bob showed yesterday, how it happens for various uh, this one. There is a reasonable, and this experiment was done at University of Manchester, we did this. And if you look at this, uh, there is a reasonable good correlation between what our model uh, has predicted with respect to this one. And uh, if you use, for example, we use uh, 1.25 mm by 1.25 mm, and if you increase it, the pit to crack transition time changes. So these are, some, and this is how the crack grows at the two different domains. And uh, the other thing which Bob did not show is, we wanted to see how the pit grows in terms of when there is a, a discontinuity like holes. If you look at here, I'm sorry, if you look at here, there is a hole, and the, these uh, uh, rhombus, what you see, is where the threshold strain is reached, where we introduce a crack for the crack to grow. If you look at it, when there is a hole, the uh, pit to crack transition occurs at much earlier compared to when you have a hole with a soft and hard inclusions. And one thing that I didn't show here is, in this case, the stress concentration here, normally if there is no pit, it is three, everybody knows, but it goes to nine in the form of pit. So that is what crosses additional failure of the world. So the pitting into with, the, there are number of uh, uh, places where you have number of revert holes and other things. But when you have a discontinuity here, the stress concentration is also plays a very important role, which is goes to nearly seven times. Uh, compared to what is there in the, uh, uh, without uh, corrosion pit happening. So next, what we said is, uh, uh, okay, this is how the whole, uh, the pit profile that goes with uh, when there is a standard specimen, when there is a, a soft inclusion, hard inclusion, and if you see with a hole, it increases much higher than other places. So this is very critical that Pitting plays a very important, uh, uh, that has to be taken into consideration when you have discontinuities in your samples. Okay, what is the limitation of the probabilistic cellular atomizer? The PCA is not directly amenable for all metal alloys. Why, for example, I said uh, nickel-based super alloy, if you do a, get a pubic diagram, you will see that there are a number of reactions which are redundant. That is, each of these reactions can be detectable from others. So there are no clear-cut uh, chemical species that we know that can be directly ported into my cellular automata to devise the corrosion rules. So this is one of the major. So we wanted to get rid of this. And uh, also what happens is requires heavy computational cost resources to uh, uh, to model this whole thing. So in order to do that, we went into peridynamic uh, formulation. Peridynamic formulation is an integral formulation. That means when you have a crack, if you will try to use something like an FEM near a crack tip, there is a singularity solution. There are going to be oscillations. 
the predictions near the crack tip will not be accurate. Whereas the integral formulation like peridynamics does away with, you don't have to worry about singularity. That's the great advantage you have. Uh, and But it is much more expensive than the regular FEM. And the idea here is if I can model the diffusion part of the uh, process using fixed law uh, in terms of chemical concentration, I can do away with my PCA directly. Uh, so that I can model all hot corrosion problems and other problems where I am not very clear about the chemical species uh, uh, playing a role. So that's what we did here. So, so if you have an interface. Uh, so the whole idea is this is the equation for the peridynamics. Integral, this is, a disc this is the integral form, this is a discretized form. We used uh, the phase change mechanics, how you use the interface. Uh, between the electrolyte and metal. I'm not going to details of this. Uh, so, so the whole idea is, um, uh, okay. So the whole idea is uh, we model everything in terms of the chemical concentration. That is the, and a chemical concentration is also a material parameter that you can measure and you can predict, and uh, this is basically the, uh, the fixed law, the discretization, uh, modeling the diffusion process. And this is the general uh, uh, flow diagram that we there, and uh, we bring in the, uh, the concept of uh, temperature and pH. For example, temperature is brought through an Einstein uh, relation that is embedded into your solution. So this is the pit profile, what we predicted with respect to uh, uh, this one. Uh, the idea here is in the region very close to the uh, pit, we use what is called the peridynamic solution. Far away, we used uh, uh, ML solution and FE solution put together. ML solution is basically got from FEM, we trained the whole network and then we have created an input output map between the uh, the in, uh, between the co corrosion concentration and the uh, responses so that we can uh, put together together so by this approach we reduce the computational cost by five times and we were able to get very reasonable very good approximation to our experimental results and this is uh, the right hand side is basically the pit profile as a function of different temperatures. And uh, uh, both uh, we got both from the peridynamic solution and peridynamics and machine learning solution. So what do we use? In this second analysis, we didn't put any stress. It is purely environmental corrosion. So we can do some more analysis. That is, we can take the concentration coming out from my model and uh, then generate the electrochemical potential which is normally used in field using what is called the nurse law which is given here and then generate a series of lookup tables which is required for the industry. So here is an example here. There are two models which we did. So this is the uh, using the values I obtained from the model and the temperature and pH, I can generate what are the different uh, uh, electrochemical uh, potential and empirical relations. So that we, we, we fitted two different models and then uh, compared it with the experimentally generated response. And this is the, the pit growth at different temperatures and this is at different pH levels. And uh, this is a model which had temperature and pitting potentials if you see. Uh, model one, uh, the trend is very similar to what we have in experiments. Model two doesn't behave that well. So basically, these kind of lookup tables is what the industry needs. You can directly say, now you at the, if you know what temperature your, your, uh, uh, your system is acting, and uh, you can say directly say what is the pitting level potential. And whether it goes up or down, you know what is the level of corrosion that you will have. And we can also bring in other parameters here, like stress and everything, and we can have a, a number of these de empirical relations that can be directly used for the industry. 
And this is a last approach where we used the probabilistic cellular automata and the bond-based perivalanomics machine learning model together. The idea here is this model can predict pit to crack transition, just the way PCA did. And this is the, the whole uh, uh, solutions uh, process, the flow, flow chart. Uh, so you have a, a corrosion loop, diffusion loop, same kind of uh, a probability we assume we use a Gutman relation. And instead of FE ex XFEM solution, we replace with peridynamics machine learning solution. So the idea here is this model is five times more computationally efficient and it requires very less memory so that you can get fast solutions. And uh, this is the uh, same problem which we did. So these are some of the predictions of the pit growth here, uh, the different levels of strains that we got and at different times uh, what we got. And uh, this is the prediction between the experiments, uh, the original PCA XFEM solution and our solutions. So, so all of this is needed because one model will not be able to give us confidence. Many other models we can put together so that uh, we know that we are going in the right direction. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, so this 10 years of work in 10 minutes is tough, so I'm trying to give you an overview. So what we need to do is modeling can help understanding corrosion science better, uh, which can help in designing better corrosion mitigation strategies. So many of the mitigation strategies are age old. They say, okay, coat uh, 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 chromium, you will get corrosion resistant. We can get better products to coat so that we will s we don't have to coat more often. We have to live with uh, corrosion, but we can live better by, by understanding the science better. And yesterday, that's what Raja said, understanding corrosion science is more important at this point of time to mitigate the effects. And uh, with uh, experimental data, with a kind of a drone imaging, modeling data like what we have developed, can be fused with AIML, what we have done here, and can help generate badly needed corrosion database. So for this, we cannot be doing testing and testing and testing. So we can do hundreds of testing using modeling. So for generating the corrosion database, very robust models are absolutely necessary. So here we have, I have given you a picture here, and this is what uh, we need to develop an AI engine. We have a computation model. We have an experimental test rig where we can do a lot of coupon level tests. We can get the field data using drones. And uh, we, the drones can have some hyperspectral imaging that can take there with a ground penet uh, uh, penetrating radars. And we can all fuse together and get a wonderful uh, database that's badly required. And that is where we need to do and how this modeling can help. And this is my thought, and thank you. Very much. technique to understand it. You have to have many tools. And of course, um, a, and you know, modeling is one of the very important ways in which you can, you can, you can synergize it, I would say, I think, okay? And uh, so if, uh, yeah, some few questions? Absolutely. Yeah, please. So, okay, one question, please, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, hello? Uh, very interesting uh, work, sir. So because I am from, <coughs> I'm Vivek from Naval Materials Research Laboratory. So we have, means we work in these areas like in life estimation and all those things where the crack initiation, which is the most important part and it happens from pit to crack initiation and the transition, that's the most important part and very beautifully you explained so many models. So, and in the last slide you very uh, explained the innovative application also. So I would just uh, like to uh, throw some comment on how you see this can be applied, this model can be applied in real time. I mean, we are try trying to get in real time corrosion monitoring and how 
combined st uh, corro stress corrosion or corrosion fatigue monitoring so placing sensors on ships etc so yeah essentially that's what i said what we need is uh, uh, corrosion is a very complex animal very difficult to understand and we need an extensive database on different kinds of things and what i just dealt with is only one form of corrosion and the previous speaker brought out the ill effects of stress corrosion cracking so we need to have an extensive database and the database because and one of the things which i forgot to mention is uncertainties there are lots of uncertainties and the beauty of the modeling is i can introduce any uncertainty in my model i can introduce the bayesian network in my model because i can create any situation in model which is not possible in real time but that is alone not sufficient we need imaging we need uh, extensive coupon testing of different situation all has to be fused together and we need a extensive national corrosion database and this has to be split into number of verticals especially for pipelines for nuclear for thermal power plant for heavy industries each of these are different and we need this database to be collected and put for the benefit of the our own industries that happens and that effort has to go a big way now and this is the time to do that yeah. so let us thank uh, the speaker for the excellent presentation he wanted some <laughs> question <laughs> so quick question yeah quick question and quick answer please now in many industries the environmental monitoring systems so uh, for a real time testing can this model can be integrated with the envir environment condition monitoring and that affect into the corrosion absolutely absolutely it can be done no, no issues it can be done so thank you very much uh, give a big hand to speaker thank you thank you do you want to some yeah i think <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> we run short of time and um, yeah it is very interesting i think during lunch time you can uh, have more discussions let me go on to the next speaker